Hello and welcome to today's Info Security Magazine webinar. My name is Dan Raywood, I'm Contributing Editor of Info Security Magazine and I'll be moderating today's event in association with Cloudflare. So for the next hour we're going to be looking at why many websites are still insecure and how to fix them. Hopefully the website you're on right now, i.e. this one, is very secure. And uh, we're going to keep this going for the next hour with some really fascinating discussion. So before I introduce you to today's panelists, a few housekeeping points from me. There are going to be three polls running throughout the hour, so please do join in with those as and when they appear. They'll be just below the screen in front of you. Uh, if you have any questions, again, options right below the screen if you have anything you want to ask. Um, if you have anything for a, a specific presenter, uh, we'll try our best to actually delegate that question to that particular speaker. Uh, if you're on Twitter, as you can see from the screen right there, we're at hashtag InfoSecWebinar and we're at InfoSecurityMag, so uh, do follow us there and uh, information on this webinar and obviously the sort of the various other things we do as well. And finally, if you're a member of ISC Squared, ISARCA or EC Council, you can claim one CPE credit based on a minimum attendance time of 60 minutes, one hour. Uh, once you've done that, download your certificate. Um, some certificates are processed uh, within 48 hours, so maybe a couple of days. Sometimes if you haven't turned up immediately uh, from actually the time of listening to actually receiving that. So uh, let's move on and introduce our speakers for today. So as I said, I'm Dan Raywood from Info Security Magazine and delighted to be joined today by two speakers from Cloudflare. Uh, Nick Sullivan is Head of Cryptography and Vlad Krasnov is System Engineer. They'll be our opening speakers today. Also delighted to be joined by Scott Helm. He's a UK researcher and also hearing us speaking with us today is Josh Ass, who is Executive Director and Co-Founder of Let's Encrypt. So really stellar lineup today and something I'm really looking forward to hearing from all four of our speakers. So if you have questions for them, do let us know uh, via the questions uh, function throughout and we'll obviously do our best to get through that. But we have got some really good content today about the uh, concept of TLS, SSL, web security, the lot. So, let's ask you about security of the internet, shall we? And to ask you, how secure do you feel the internet currently is? I'm going to start the voting right there. So, very secure. Some websites are trustworthy. Very uh, unsecure. Or completely insecure. So, kind of three, and then somewhere in the middle there with that second option. So, do let us know. I'm going to leave that poll running uh, for the duration of our first uh, presentation today, which is by Nick Sullivan and Vlad Krasnov from Cloudflare. Um, so Nick and Vlad, I'm going to hand the slide deck over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that as, and thanks for the introduction. Yes, I'm, I'm Nick Sullivan from Cloudflare. I work on TLS and encryption and a, a lot of different things to help make the internet more secure for people who are setting up websites and uh, managing web services. So on the agenda for this first presentation, uh, we'll talk about some problems that have happened with TLS. For, first of all, we'll explain what TLS is. It's the in encryption uh, protocol for, um, for the web, for, for protecting people's traffic between the browser and a website. So what, what problems have there been with TLS in the past? Um, uh, we'll go on to why TLS 1.2 was slow to be adopted, and um, TLS 1.2 is the current published standard for, for TLS, and uh, then we'll talk about what problems and vulnerabilities were addressed in TLS 1.3, which is the new upcoming version of TLS that is um, soon to be ratified, and we'll chat about uh, how fast TLS 1.3 will likely be adopted in the marketplace um, and whether or not that'll, that's faster than what happened with TLS 1.2. Um, then uh, Vlad will take over and uh, chat with you, you all about uh, the crypto myth, which is um, how expensive crypto is and uh, the cryptography itself. And, and at the very end, we'll have a discussion here about how we can help solve these problems. So first, um, <clears throat> Some background here, uh, HTTPS, uh, this, if you're using a browser right now, you can look in your menu bar and it'll say HTTPS colon something something. If you're on a website that's using encryption, uh, HTTP is the protocol used for exchanging web pages between a browser and a server. Uh, so when you're, when you're browsing around web pages, you're using HTTP. S is the security layer on top. So um, HTTPS is HTTP plus security. So, 
the security comes from TLS, which is transport layer security. This is a protocol that uses encryption um, to make sure that uh, you have protection of the information as it, as it transits through the internet, um, that it has integrity, it hasn't been modified, and it also provides a way for the server to authenticate itself to the, the browser, and uh, this is done with certificates. And these keys are negotiated um, in what's called a handshake. So that's, that's just a, a bare minimum background for HTTPS. Um, so as I mentioned, TLS is the protocol underneath it, and it's had a, a long and uh, interesting evolution. Uh, it started in the 90s by uh, <clears throat> a company called Netscape. You may remember they had a browser called uh, Netscape Navigator and then Communicator, but um, it started out its life as a protocol called SSL, Secure Socket Layer. And uh, as, as the end of the 90s came, um, <clears throat> drew to a close, uh, the IETF, which is the standards body that uh, manages internet standards, uh, sort of took, took SSL and, and turned it into a standard called TLS. And, and this, was, this was called TLS 1.0, TLS 1. Um, this, this is, this is the, the, the standard that's used for all HTTPS uh, is based on, H, on TLS. And uh, in the mid-first decade of the um, 21st century, uh, this was updated slightly to something called TLS 1.1, and then there was a version called 1.2, which was in 2008, and now we're talking about in 2018 as uh, at TLS v 1.3. So TLS has evolved over the years, but what what have the problems been? There's there's some reasons to think that TLS is 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 strong and it's it allows things to be encrypted, but you, you know it has problems and uh, these problems are highlighted in the slide uh, and they include SSL v2, the original version being broken and cracked almost immediately, and there's been a litany of different problems found in in TLS, whether it's from the implement, implementation side or the protocol side, and uh, a lot of these these attacks on TLS have sort of fun names or acronyms, but um, it's really not, not a funny thing when, when you're actually talking about people's safety online. Um, so just for, <clears throat> for the sake of this conversation, we're, we're going to go into one of these problems that was found in TLS, and this is, this is padding oracles. Um, and it shows up in a number of different uh, iterations throughout uh, how TLS is used. Um, one of the constructions in TLS is called Mac then encrypt. Uh, this is this was a choice that was made early on in the in SSL um, and then carried over to TLS that allows uh, someone who's in establishing a connection to use uh, what's called a, a block cipher. So um, data is encrypted in blocks. Uh, typically, uh, the algorithms that use block ciphers, the, or block ciphers that are used, include uh, triple DES, uh, which is now deprecated, and AES, which is the advanced encryption standard. And with AES, you have 16 byte blocks. And uh, the issue is, what happens um, if your data does not align directly with these um, 16 byte blocks? And uh, to to fix that, you have to add additional padding. So you have to take, take the rest of uh, the, the remaining bytes and, and fill them in. So in TLS, this padding is dependent on how much space. If there's only one byte of space, you fill it in with zeros. If there's two bytes, you fill it in with ones, so, and so forth and, and so forth. Three bytes, you fill it in with twos. Um, now, uh, this construction of doing a uh, encryption over top of uh, an I a HMAC, which is uh, integrity, so you have encryption and integrity and padding, uh, was actually found to be insecure quite a long time ago. There was a, a paper in 2002 by Vaudenay describing how you could um, use this padding to help actually decrypt the data. Um, and that's sort of what this slide describes, um, is that if an attacker can manipulate one of the bytes, they can extract a, a little bit of data based on whether or not um, the server has a different answer for, for guessing the padding. So, so to, be, to be clear, um, <clears throat> what was happening here is that uh, 
if the padding was correct, then the server would error and would give a specific error of one type. And if the padding is incorrect, it would give an error of a different type. And being able to uh, differentiate between these two types of errors turned out to, to break the entire security of, of the scheme. And um, you can go piece by piece to, to decrypt uh, this data. Um, so this idea of an attacker messing around with padding to figure things out um, has been around for a very long time. And it's, this is a, a construction of block ciphers that use um, Mac first and then encrypt. Um, Another instantiation of, of this type of attack was uh, Poodle, which was uh, an attack discovered against SSL v3, which was still in use um, back when this happened. I, I believe it's uh, 2014. Um, so the problem with Poodle uh, was, was very similar. There's a way for an attacker to trigger uh, different behavior based on whether or not the padding was correct or not, and they could manipulate the padding. Um, and this was really bad because it allowed someone to decrypt entire sessions uh, very, very quickly. And, um, and the reason that Poodle ended up being very bad was um, in TLS, the way that it was implemented in browsers, uh, was it was designed so that um, t if you failed a connection with TLS 1.2, it would downgrade to 1.1 and try. And then if that failed, it would downgrade again to 1.0. And if that failed, it would downgrade again to SSL v3. And um, this downgrade can be triggered by an attacker. So even though you could use TLS 1.2, which is a lot more secure than SSL v3, uh, attackers were able to, to kind of downgrade these. So these are, these are just two examples of, of the litany of problems that uh, existed in TLS, um, at least it, TLS 1.2, depending on, on the implementation over the years. So uh, looking at this list, a lot of these have to do with, some of them have to do with padding, some of them have to do with weak ciphers, some of them have to do with the actual construction of the protocol itself. So um, this begs, the, the, or this introduces the question, which is um, TLS 1.2 uh, was finalized and ratified in 2008, but um, it was actually slow to be adopted. If you look at the charts here, um, this is from SSL Pulse, which is a, a service that uh, takes server configurations and sees what version of uh, different protocols they, they support. And you can see here 2012, uh, TLS 1.2 and 1.0, 1.1, um, were barely, barely even implemented. And this is four years after the final, uh, the final publication of TLS 1.2. Um, uh, this kind of hopped up by February of 2014, but you can see SSL v3 still existed. And uh, by 2015, SSL v3 was brought down to around 30%, which um, considering how bad of an attack or how bad of a vulnerability Poodle is, this is, this is not very good. But at, at this point, by 2015, um, most websites supported uh, TLS 1.2. <clears throat> now, that's on the server side. What about on the client side? This is uh, browse, you have to have two to tango. So uh, if a server supports TLS 1.2, uh, and the client supports 1.2, that's the only time you can actually do it. So this was um, only implemented in major browsers, uh, Chrome 30, Firefox 27, uh, Internet Explorer 11, iOS 10.9. All of these came out around 2013 uh, or 14. So again, five years after the um, publication of the record of uh, TLS 1.2. Now, why did it take so long? Well, the question uh, ties back to this idea that we, from Poodle of, of downgrades is that uh, some servers, if you connect with TLS 1.2, um, rather than silently or rather than, than doing the correct thing in the, in the protocol, which is to um, use the highest version of TLS that both parties support, it would just disconnect. So um, because so many servers out there would have this kind of failure mode where they would just disconnect if they saw something they didn't understand, um, browsers had to implement this insecure downgrade, which is what emphasized Poodle from uh, getting <clears> – <throat> it, it accentuated the, the problems that, that led to Poodle, as well as um, making it difficult for browsers to turn it on by default. Um, so in order to 
turn this on by default, you want to have a good user experience. You don't want people to have broken web pages. So it, it took a while for servers to be fixed to the point where TLS 1.2 was actually deployable. So all of this is, this is well and good, and, and these vulnerabilities have been coming up for a while. Um, so the IETF got together and decided, let's, let's do a new version of TLS and make sure that these really bad vulnerabilities, things that make your website insecure, uh, don't happen again. And so um, TLS 1.3, most of what it did was actually just removing support for features, um, features that were not necessary uh, to keep the protocol alive, but that have been found to be problematic. So specific ciphers, uh, triple DES, RC4, um, weak cipher mode, CBC mode, which is um, a block cipher mode that I, I described earlier where um, you had different padding attacks to this. Um, weak public key modes, uh, RSA is, is one type of public key operation that you can use, but the, there's, there's different modes here that were brittle and fragile and very difficult to do correctly. So these were removed as well. Um, and the ability to do an insecure downgrade to, to previous versions is also removed. Um, and there's also some, some protocol things. So TLS 1.3 was really a cleaning house. It got rid of all these sort of potentially vulnerable things and uh, really reduced the feature set to the more secure core in TLS 1.2. Um, now TLS 1.2 had these, this intolerance issue that caused it to take up to five years after publication to be deployed. Um, we'll, are we at risk of this happening again to TLS 1.3? It's a lot more secure, but is it something that, that we're going to be able to, um, <clears throat> to adopt and, and use as, as soon as, it, as it's published, which could be as soon as um, the next couple of weeks? So um, one of the reasons why TLS 1.3 should do a much better job at being deployed was that uh, during its development, it was tested. It was tested in production. So uh, this means that Chrome and Firefox and these different browsers, as well as services like Gmail and Facebook and uh, some of Cloudflare services, were enabled with different earlier versions of TLS 1.3 to see how it worked in the real world. Um, and there were s some issues found, especially with uh, network appliances. Um, there were some, some intolerance servers still who sort of didn't learn the lesson from TLS 1.2. And um, this led to some innovation. So in TLS 1.3, um, it was slightly changed to make it more friendly to, to these intolerant um, implementations. And uh, this really interesting concept call, called Grease was introduced, um, which is intended to prevent future intolerance. Um, and so, we estimate we think that TLS 1.3 is actually going to be deployed very very soon um, relative to when it's actually published and finalized at the IETF. So we don't expect another five years, and and this is um, to the credit of the of the folks who developed this algorithm. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Vlad, who's going to talk about some other reasons why. Um, even if different versions of TLS are deployed, not all websites are even HTTPS at this point. And uh, there are some, some reasons for that. Vlad. Uh, yes, hi. I'm Vlad. I work on the performance at Cloudflare, including cryptography performance. And as uh, Nick told, I want to talk about the expensive crypto name. And the reason why cryptography has a bad reputation for being slow and actually historically prevented the people from deploying to a lesser scale. So I'm going to go over a few of those myths and distill them one by one. Uh, so although today it's definitely a myth and the photography performance shouldn't hinder any modern CPU in any way, a few years ago that was not the case. If we start from the key exchange, for example, People think that key exchange is slow. And it was slow because historically people would use RSA a few years ago because ECDSA was not very widely available. And although Suite B, which includes P256 and the P381 curves was released in 2005, there was a concern about patterns and the CAs didn't really allow you to sign elliptic curve certificates. 
Uh, and the problem with RSA is that it's basically a modular exponentiation, which means a lot of big numbers have been multiplied all the time. And uh, up until 2003, we had only 32 bit systems, which were very, very slow at it, uh, because you basically have to deal with 32 bit digits. And with the newer servers, which are 64 bits, you have fewer fewer multiplications and is much faster. Uh, obviously it took uh, for the ecosystem a while to catch up. And until now we see OpenSSL uh, releasing updates to newer architectures to make it faster all the time. If we see a degra uh, the graph over the last 10 years, performance of uh, public key uh, cryptography improved 100 times which is insane. Uh, if 10 years ago you would do RSA 1024 at 10,000 uh, signatures per second on top of the line CPU, today you can get 1 million ECDSA signatures per second, which is on a scale of something that Cloudflare does globally. So you can have one CPU handle all of your public cryptography needs, which is pretty neat. And needless to say, RSA 1024 is deprecated, and RSA 2048 is not as secure as ECDSA. So to sum up what you should do if you deploy crypto or TLS, get an ECDSA certificate. It's pretty simple nowadays. And enable an ECDSA with, with the ECDHE cipher suite. And uh, you don't need to worry about public key performance anymore. So the other myth is that encryption itself is slow. And again, historically, it wasn't very fast. Uh, a few years ago, we would use uh, ciphers like RC4, which is by itself not very slow, but it has a very small key and it was broken a while ago. Uh, 3DS and the ASCBC are actually much slower, but uh, using the, the SNI, SCBC somewhat improved. But starting with TLS 1.2, you can use the ASGCM and the Chacha 20 Poly 1305, which are much, much faster than any of those three slower cipher suites. And a modern CPU, again, if you look at the graph, can handle more than 100,000, 100 gigabits per second using the S128 GCM. Uh, and again, the RC4 is deprecated and the SCBC, as Nick told you, is probably shouldn't be used either. So definitely upgrade to TLS 1.2 and definitely use the SGCM or charge poly. Another myth is not a really a myth, it is historically accurate, is the TLS adds round trips because you have to perform the handshake that gets you two extra round trips and that is expensive. And a few years ago, networks were very, very slow, latency was high, so two round trips could add many expensive milliseconds to a connection. A TLS 1.2 already supports a method to reduce the number of round trips by what is called session resumption using either tickets or session IDs. And that means you have one less round trip. With the less 1.3, you get that by default. So even a full handshake, uh, you need only one round trip. If you send the right uh, client hello at least. And there is an option for zero round trip with some caveats, but it is there. Another thing that is available for most people today is that you can deploy in any geography. For example, if you use AWS or GCC, you can just choose where you want your web service to run and be close to your clients. And of course, if your clients are everywhere, then you can use a CDN that is a for example, the Cloudflare map, which means 
the CDN handles your TLS handshakes. It is very close to the client. It is sub 10 milliseconds uh, latency usually. And uh, you get other benefits, like you don't need to do almost any crypto. By the way, this map is already outdated, I think uh, in the week since this was published, we opened maybe 30 new data centers. And the last uh, thing I want to talk about is the overhead of the actual data you transfer over TLS. And uh, Nick uh, showed an image of uh, how a record looks for ASCBC, for example, and you have a five bytes uh, header, you have uh, up to 20 bytes of uh, the Mac that you have to use. And also if you use a block cipher, you have to pad it to the block size, which is usually 16 bytes. Uh, if your records are really small, then yeah, that's significant overhead. But if you use ASGCM, you only have 16 bytes for the Mac, and this is somewhat lower overhead than it used to be. In terms of handshake, you usually have another overhead, and that's sending the client hello, the server hello, sending certificate chains, and if you use RSA, for example, those can be quite big. Uh, however, if you use ECDSA, the certificates are much smaller. You should also try and uh, keep your certificate chain as short as possible. And uh, I prefer just you know using the root signature on my certificate. Uh, and the nice additions that TLS 1.3 will bring is certificate compression with the broadly. So you even have a lower overhead. Uh, same goes for uh, the key exchange. ECDHE using a curve 25519 gives you the lowest overhead for the key exchange. Uh, other methods to compensate for this overhead and actually get better compression and the lower bandwidth usage with TLS is A, you can use HTTP2 which by itself is a huge uh, performance uh, booster because it allows you to use a multiplex uh, request over a single connection. And also has a neat feature called HPEC, which is a header compression algorithm that if you send more than one request, will usually save you anywhere between 50% and 70% of your header size. And headers today tend to be huge, especially if you use cookies. And another compression uh, feature that is only available over TLS is Broadly. Broadly is again, a new method. It improves compression by about 30% uh, in the best scenario compared to GZIP that is used today. The reason why it is only available over TLS is because middle boxes that don't uh, support it would just break things, uh, a lesson that was learned uh, when Google uh, tried to deploy sandwich compression too. Uh, uh, another thing, yeah, I wanted to touch is people think that certificates are expensive in terms of money and are hard to manage, but let's encrypt solve it. Luckily for all of us, but uh, let let's encrypt. Let's talk about it, I guess. To the future, there is uh, the quantum computer uh, threat that we're uh, all hearing about. And the uh, Cloudflare, for example, started uh, taking care of internal connections by adding a post-quantum uh, secure key exchange uh, in uh, the psych algorithm. And definitely today we know cryptography is cheap. Tomorrow it might get a little bit more expensive because some of the post-quantum algorithms in the NIST contribution today are quite expensive in terms of CPU usage, but we shall hope they be optimized in time and not offer that much slowdown to the TLS we have today. I think I'm uh, done.
Great, thank you very much, Vlad. Yeah, I think um, just one more slide, I think, from Cloudflare. So I'll just push that on. How can you help solve this problem? Um, maybe one of you two can enlighten us to what this. Um, this I presume this is to uh, to Cloudflare's research, is it? Yeah. So. For, for folks who uh, are, are interested in understanding this intolerance problem and uh, and s saying some servers are unable to handle TLS 1.3, uh, we, we built a, a small test site called uh, TLS13.mitm.watch. MITM stands for man in the middle. This is uh, hmm. uh, the t <laughs> typically uh, the type of attack that people do on TLS. So um, if any if anybody is in a corporate environment or um, or somewhere where it, they think that there there may be some sort of funny business going on to to prevent them from upgrading for to TLS 1.3. Um, go to this site and see if it works. It it, it just tests uh, the viability of your connection. So this is this is our way of helping the community uh, debug these problems. Great, right, and that's just an open, free tool to, for anyone to use. It's not like it's uh, I, I, I won't show me yes, backed by Cloudflare, but anyone can go along and use that. You mean? Yep, it's a free tool. It's not associated with the product. Great. Okay, well, absolutely brilliant. If you need more information on TLS uh, 1.3, obviously we are going to be uh, talking another 30 minutes here about this. So if you have any questions about TLS 1.3 or anything that's just been covered, we are going to be coming back later on. Um, but for now, we're going to move on and introduce our second poll question. So a few thanks to Vlad and to Nick from Cloudflare. I thought it really set the, uh, the scene. We've got some real points we're going to raise later on as well. Um, we're going to launch that second vote. So let me uh, go back and we're going to ask you, why do you think TLS 1.2 needed to be updated? Now, I did create this poll vote having looked at Cloudflare slides. And so I kind of picked a few things out that maybe were changing the way that, uh, that well, transport layer security was actually uh, developing. So. Is it these things? Is it cloud and server deployments? Uh, I was quite interested by a point which Nick made about um, 1.3 1. 1. was tested in production before finalizing the specification. Nick, I might come back to you in a second to ask if 1.2 wasn't. <laughs> and so I'll come back to you in a second. Um, is IoT, is that a reason why uh, there needs to be better security? You know, the devices inherently aren't hugely secure. Maybe in actual the, sort of the transport layer actually does need to be secure. Um, a more open internet. I kind of thought, you know, are we in a time now where, you know, we're, we're, we've got an open internet with social networking and um, we're able to actually contribute? Is that is that been one of the problems? It's much less closed than it used to be. Oh, are there a few folks? I think it's another reason why it needs to be updated. Then do do click on other and let us know by the questions what that uh, what that reason is. Why it's other? Obviously, we're always keen to hear from you uh, why you think that another reason that we've missed. So that's going to we're going to leave that running uh, for now. So just before we move on to our next presenter, Nick, I just want to ask you that quick question then, because you mentioned there about TLS 1.2 had problems being deployed due to server intolerance. 1.3 was tested in production. So was 1.2? Do you think it just wasn't tested properly? It seemed like there was quite a lengthy rollout anyway. Yeah. So TLS 1.2 was tested, but it wasn't tested at the scale of uh, of the internet. In, in that um, it wasn't tested with a very large subset of, of actual internet users. And uh, so some of the things that we discovered uh, as a community with TLS 1.3, um, they really required uh, a big percentage of servers to support a, a pre-release version as well as, as a lot of clients. So uh, this is something that just wasn't part of the ethos in 2008. Um, it, was, it was hard to uh, get experimental protocols into browsers at that point, but um, uh, it's worked out really well for TLS 1.3. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Thanks very much. Um, right. We're going to move on and introduce our second or third speaker officially. Uh, I'd like to welcome Scott Helm. Scott Helm is a UK researcher and uh, security researcher and writer. And um, delighted to have him on. So, Scott, I'm going to hand over to you. Cheers, Dan. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, thank you for having me on. Um, I'll just shift over to my introduction slide. Um, as Dan said, I'm an independent researcher. Um, I have a background in, in QA and pen testing. Uh, and moved into the security space, I think, through, um, through passion and hobby, like a lot of people have, really. And I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the journey that I see, um, the wider kind of internet, the wider industry is taking right now towards everybody wanting to get this icon into their browser. Um, we, we've always had the need for encryption. You know, that's always been there. And from a technical perspective, that's always been understood. But I've, in my time, I've often found that, you know, the fact that deploying encryption is the right thing to do is not always enough motivation for people to do it. 
Um, but we are making tremendous progress on this now. And I'm going to look at, you know, well, I think for a lot of the reasons that, that we're starting to see this, this great progress being made. So one of the things that I do, I have um, this biannual report that I publish where I scan the top 1 million sites on the web provided by Alexa. It's the Alexa top 1 million. And I analyze, um, I actually do this every day and publish the report every six months. And I analyze a whole different raft of features. And one of the ones that I've been really interested in watching over the last couple of years is this one. Uh, and this is the, the percentage of sites that redirect from HTTPS if I try to connect to them on HTTP. So I'll connect to their site, HTTP, follow the redirect chain. And the, the sheer number of sites, as you can see here now, over the last couple of years especially, has seen tremendous growth. Um, and, you know, like month after month when, when I do these reports, I'm always fascinated to see that we're, we're still maintaining a really high rate of growth of HTTPS. So this is really fantastic to see. And there's been many different contributing factors to this beyond, you know, beyond the fact that we just need to have a, a more secure web. Um, so I want to try and go through a few of those now. And for me, my, my kind of biggest one that I'm seeing right now is, is actually Let's Encrypt themselves. And... Let's Encrypt, they, they knock down two fundamental barriers. I work with lots of different companies. I do consultancy and I do training. And I, I often come across the cost of certificates as one of the biggest deployments to HTTPS. You know, sometimes I speak to teams and departments that want to deploy this, but sometimes just going through procurement and just getting the company credit card is a burden. It's not necessarily the cost itself. It's the process of approving that cost. Um, so removing the cost barrier to obtaining certificates was one of the, the two biggest wins uh, that I saw from Let's Encrypt in that, you know, now in my training courses, we all have our lab environments and we can actually just get certificates for real and go through the whole process. You know, we don't need to simulate this anymore. And the second part that ties into that as well um, was their implementation of the ACME API to allow organizations to start to automate the process of certificate issuance. Right now, I run multiple services online. I have my blog. I have Report Your Eye, Security, there's all of them. And I actually, I don't know when any of the certificates expire on any of those services. I know that when the time comes, they will automatically renew and obtain a new certificate using the Acme API from Let's Encrypt. And that, that kind of contributes to the cost factor a little bit in that the reduced maintenance and overhead um, alleviates a burden from an organization. You know, if you want to deploy HTTPS and get certificates, you then have to look after them. But if you automate the process, you don't. So you're not adding an additional cost. Um, and the automation as well ties into lower certificate lifetimes. We, you know, things that you do frequently, you do well, but things that you automate, you can pretty much never get wrong. And it's not just Let's Encrypt. I, I use Let's Encrypt in a few of my services, but there are other ways to get free uh, HTTPS onto your websites now. And another big one that I come across is Cloudflare with their universal SSL offering, where even on their free tier plan now with Cloudflare, you can drop your website onto um, onto Cloudflare. I don't, I don't use the term CDN. I don't think it does justice to the products they offer now. Uh, but, you know, you can put yourself behind the Cloudflare CDN and, and they will do obtaining certificates for you. They handle renewal, rotation, and you can drop a Cloudflare Origin cert on your Origin. So you don't even need to buy and manage certificates yourselves anymore. So that's, like, that's kind of like two of the biggest uh, factors that I see that have been driving us towards HTTPS recently. Um, when I say driving us towards HTTPS, we've actually been driving towards specifically TLS v1.2 that Nick was just talking about. And aside from removing the barriers, like the cost and, and the technical barriers, we've also seen the introduction of kind of things to tempt people to deploy TLS. We've seen incentivization of HTTPS. Now, again, Nick mentioned uh, the H2 protocol. I think Vlad just talked about it as well, actually, sorry, where you can do things like connection multiplexing. You, can, you get native header compression now, so you can make your site go faster to offset some of the, the now tiny costs of deploying TLS. Uh, Brotley compression was another one that he just mentioned. I've been using Brotley for quite some time now and see about 36% uh, benefit overall by using that. Um, I think another big factor for me was the SEO boost that Google started giving. It was quite a few years ago now. If I, from memory, if I remember correctly, it was perhaps 2014, 15 time um, when it started to be a positive indicator for your SEO. And 
you know, if I approach an organization, I'm trying to encourage people to do the right thing, deploy encryption because it's the right thing to do. It doesn't always sell sell the idea. But if you say, hey, we can make your website go faster and give you a boost in your SEO, this really starts to change the focus of the conversation and change how perceptive people are to that. Um, of course, we've got limitations in the browser, geolocation, and other powerful APIs in the browser are now being restricted more and more to HTTPS only. Um, if you care about referrer data, if you have inbound referrers coming from secure sites and you're not a secure site, you're potentially losing referrer data there. And of course, session resumption <clears throat> that Vlad just talked about. And the, 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 the thing that I refer to here is HTTP bad, this, this changing stance of the browsers as well, where we've had HTTP for a long time and there's never a negative marker on HTTP. If you deploy HTTPS and you do it wrong, the browser will shout at you. And it will tell you that you've done something wrong. And now in Chrome and in Firefox, we're starting to see more and more negative indicators on HTTP with the not secure warnings if there is a password or credit card field on HTTP. And these are only going to become stronger over time. They're going to become more and more prevalent to the point eventually, you know, the ultimate goal is that HTTP will be marked as bad all of the time. And all of these factors together are, are contributing towards this huge drive uh, that we're seeing right now towards HTTPS, or you know, towards the deployment of TLS 1.2. And to help you do that, we don't just have the incentives to do that. There's also better and more tools to help you do that as well, to support you in getting to that. I've been a huge advocate of content security policy for a long time. If, if you've heard of me before, see my blog, or see me on Twitter, you'll know that I talk about CSP a lot. Um, CSP can help you if you're moving from HTTP to HTTPS. Uh, things like the Upgrade Insecure Request Directive. You can almost completely fix mixed content to the point where you will never at least see a mixed content one. You will never make an insecure request. And also, CSP has a really cool reporting feature. Um, you know, the, the company, my logo in the bottom right is Report URI. We are a CSP reporting service, and, and we're seeing more and more sites every week use this to help them in their transition, to help them in their migration, because you can ask the browser, if you have mixed content on your site, would the user see an error? Do we need to fix things before we flip the switch? Um, and strict transport security as well, it's another security header as we call them. Browsers were built in a world when HTTP was the only protocol, and HTTP is still the default protocol or default scheme of the web. Um, strict transport security allows us to start changing that stance where the browsers will do the secure thing by default and also enforce that as well. Those certificate errors that we all see so often and possibly click through when we're on a you know wi-fi at our hotel and a captive portal tries to grab you um you know all of these things start to benefit you and, and when you combine them all together you know the migration to, to https starts to become a very attractive proposition now of course everything so far has been driving us towards tls 1.2 and we actually don't quite have tls 1.3 yet but very soon we will be driving hard towards the adoption of tls 1.3 as well and the thing that i love about tls version 1.3 is that in many ways it's the most complex that the protocol we've ever had because it's going to be the most secure the fastest one with the best features but at the same time tls 1.3 is also probably going to be the simplest that it's ever been and that that sounds like kind of a, a contradiction so uh, let me explain. I do, um, as I said, I do training courses for TLS. And um, just today, actually, I'm coming to you from, literally from my hotel room in Germany right now. I've just done the first day of my TLS training course. And we've actually been doing Cypher Suite configurations today, building Cypher Suite lists. And in TLS 1.2, you have about 1,000 different options, and 990 of them are a terrible idea. You know, they're really daunting. They're really off-putting. And, and they can be confusing to people trying to adopt this. If you compare that to TLS 1.3, I have the, the exact list of all of the available TLS 1.3 Cypher Suites on the screen right now. This is it. This is all that you get. And I was listening to a talk that you gave recently, actually, Nick, where he said that with cryptography, fewer options means better options. And, and that is exactly true here in that if you can deploy TLS 1.3 and you can make it work, it will be a good configuration because these are the only options and, and they're the only ones that we actually wanted to use anyway. We've torn out all of the history uh, that TLS 1.2 has and, and simplified it in, in TLS 1.3. And, you know, if you're stood in front of a, a room of people and trying to, to convince them to deploy this, and they're looking at this huge list of cipher suites that 
you know, 90% of which are terrible ideas, it makes that a hard sell. So personally, I'm really looking forward to TLS 1.3 and, and the huge simplification that it will bring to actually deploying the protocol. Um, and again, I think it was Vlad and Nick in the Cloudflare section touched on the better performance options that are coming in, in TLS 1.3. I often come up against the network latency of the round trips added by TLS 1.2. And, and as they said, we can negate most of that with session resumption. We often see that happening with tickets, uh, less so with session IDs. Um, but TLS 1.2 incurs two network round trips, and we can reduce that to one on resume sessions, which is you know kind of most of the time. But we start with one by default in TLS 1.3, and that's largely because of the reduction in the number of cipher suites. The client can actually pretty much just guess the correct value because there's only five and we pretty much know which one we're going to prefer anyway. So because of that simplification, we can get down to one round trips. Uh, and I think Vlad touched on the zero round trip option for TLS 1.3. Uh, that's not going to be you know, universal. It will be enabled on a, a per application basis. You need to make sure uh, that that's suitable for you, but it will be possible to open the connection and fire all of the messages and the application request in a single go. Um, and when we get there, when we can do that, you know, TLS has no network latency over the top of just doing a straight HTTP connection. So I think that's going to be another really important thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, we have the security aspects of TLS 1.3 as well. This is the, the reason that we advance these protocols. We deploy encryption is for the security. And TLS 1.3 has much better default stances on everything across the board than prior versions of the protocol. In TLS 1.2 now, forward secrecy is optional. And everybody, absolutely everybody that's using TLS should be using forward secrecy. There's really not much of a question uh, to be had about that. But forward secrecy is optional in TLS 1.2. You, you can deploy your configuration with or without it. And that's at the you know, that's at the decision of the, the person writing the config. In TLS 1.3, we have forward secrecy all of the time, non-optional. Uh, session tickets as well. That was a very, um, it was a very big thing for people that wanted session tickets to get the resumption to go from two round trips to one in the handshake. But the ticket key, uh, the session ticket key in, in 1.2 introduced kind of a, a breach almost of, of forward secrecy. And again, that has been resolved in TLS 1.3, the protocol is, is becoming more secure by default. Uh, but the one drawback I will add, that slight caveat there, the early data, that is when we have uh, zero round trip connections in 1.3. And um, there's no forward secrecy of early data. Of course, that wasn't applicable in 1.2. We don't have an equivalent. Um, but everything by default across the board in 1.3 is better than it was in 1.2. It's more secure by default and everything is simpler. There are less choices for people to make. Uh, and I think that that will mean that there are less mistakes to be made in, in these deployments. So I'm hoping that the, the continued drive towards TLS 1.2 now will transition forward into TLS 1.3. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing this mass adoption across the board for all of the right reasons. Uh, and I think, you know, I think that is helping TLS 1.3. And I think the performance advantages and, and the simpler nature of 1.3 will help, you know, people like me and others like me that are trying to convince people to deploy TLS, uh, to, you know, to take away those barriers. Um, so, yeah, I, I want to wrap it up there. Uh, say thanks for having me. I think, uh, Dan, you're collecting questions um, for the end there, aren't you? And I'm quite looking forward to hearing from Josh at, at Let's Encrypt as well. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. One that Scott and I have been talking about offline, uh, following Nick's presentation, which we're going to come back to uh, in just a second. There's also a couple of things from Nick's presentation, which we'll cover. But if you have, we've got just over ten minutes left. Uh, so, if there's anything you do want to ask um, any of the speakers, we are going to introduce Josh in just a second. Then do obviously let us know. So, with that, we are going to introduce the third and final poll vote, poll question. So, let me stop the previous one. And we'll launch the one you can see on your screen right now, which is, uh, we're seeing greater adoption of SSL. Uh, will this make the internet more trusted? Um, so simple, yes. Uh, depends which website you're on. Uh, depends on the website certificate authority. Interesting one. Uh, or no, quite simple. So that is going to run, we're going to run that for the, sort of the next 10 minutes or so. 
to uh, make sure that we can, uh, you know, we can actually cover that. Um, just before we do actually uh, move on, I'm going to introduce um, Josh. Josh from Let's Encrypt. Um, we've had a few comments today about Let's Encrypt, so uh, hopefully if you're, you know, familiar with them. But the live one, Josh asked, who's the executive director and co-founder. Um, just before we do move on to introduce you, Josh, I'm going to actually just read out this first poll question, and we asked how secure. The internet currently is. Um, Seventy percent of those who voted uh, said some websites are trustworthy. Twenty-five percent very unsecure. Five percent completely unsecure. No one said very secure. Um, and um, maybe Josh, let's just bring you bring you on that point then. So most people here who are listening to this feel that some websites are trustworthy, and it's deliberately why I put the CA question in just before we introduced you. Um, is, it, is this why you know you're, you're you're aiming with Let's Encrypt, and obviously you know both Cloudflare and Scott have mentioned you today. Why there's a need to push uh, free SSL certificates out there because of this feeling that this, generally the web is unsecure. Yeah. Hi. Well, let me start with a short story that gives you some idea of why we started Let's Encrypt, and I think answers your question. A few years ago, we were working on the HTTP2 protocol, so the, the second major version of HTTP. And I was working on that at the time. And my main goal was to convince the creators of HTTP2 to require encryption for HTTP2, because we really shouldn't be making new protocols that aren't secure by default these days. But there was a really good objection to making it secure by default. And the, and the objection to requiring TLS and HTTP2 was that, first of all, you would make HTTP2 much harder to deploy in limited adoption because getting certificates was difficult. And the second one is that you would make HTTP2 pay to play. Since you wouldn't be able to deploy HTTP2 unless you went out and paid a certificate authority for a certificate. So those are two pretty big consequences to making HTTP2 secure by default. And as someone advocating for that, I felt like we needed to take those criticisms seriously and do something about that. So that's re really when we re started getting going on Let's Encrypt. And the goal was to, first of all, make deploying TLS really easy, as easy as possible. And most of the pain was coming from certificate authorities and getting and managing certificates. So we knew we needed to make an easier way to get certificates. And we also need to make them free. If certificates, if someone's not providing free certificates, then, then we introduce this cost barrier to participation on the web that was never there before. You could always participate, you just couldn't participate securely, but if we're going to require HTTP, if we're going to require TLS in new versions of HTTP or across the web in, in general with browsers enforcing, then we really don't want to require everyone to get out a credit card to participate in that. So those are the major goals of Let's Encrypt, and that's a good example of why we started Let's Encrypt. We are, our certificates are free, but that's mainly in service of ease of use. Um, so yeah. That's one question I've got, really. I mean, having, I'm going to hopefully speak for the untechnical man here, uh, who is probably watching this going, you know, thinking, trying to learn for the first time about TLS. Does TLS 1.3, or the, the move from 1.2 to 1.3, does that affect what you're doing uh, at Let's Encrypt in terms of SSL? No. The, the, the certificates used are the same between the, the TLS protocol versions. It doesn't change anything on our end. Okay. All right, that's good to know. I was just curious, you know, it, it's, I understand the concept of, you know, I think Scott had the, uh, the HTTPS and, uh, you know, we've been preaching about look for the, the green padlock. I mean, maybe that's just one more question for you then. You know, we, we, that first question there, people think the web is unsecure. I mean, does that, you know, does that worry you that people, or, or does it actually maybe does it kind of reaffirm why you're doing what you do is because people think there's this general unsecurity around the Internet that, that people aren't trusting it. Is that a good thing that people aren't trusting the internet rather than pe everyone's been a bit more kind of lackadaisical and just does what they like? I think it's good that people are careful. Anything, any, any system that you're entrusting, you know, very private parts of your life to financial or personal or otherwise, it's good to be careful about what you're doing. So I think a degree of care is certainly called for even, even when we have great new technologies like 
HTTPS everywhere and TLS 1.3. Um, those are big steps forward for the web, but they don't mean that the web is secure even when they're 100% deployed, right? There are lots there are lots of dangers on the web and places where things can go wrong. And what we've talked about today, they're big improvements, but they don't solve all the problems of security and safety on the web. So care is still needed. Make sure you're on the websites that you intend to be on and you know, be careful about where you send your data. Yeah, and be careful. I suppose the uh, connection, I was in a conversation this morning with someone about using where, where, when you use your uh, your access your banking website, for example, and um, yeah, uh, the, these stories that come out, people use it in, for example, public libraries and uh, you know, uh, all the sort of the suspicious places in internet cafes. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it, for people it's a little bit of a restriction. But um, we're going to do is bring um, everybody in because uh, one question that Scott and I were talking about, and I'm going to throw this one to Nick first. Um, it was on about your, another question there, but you made this point about 1.2 had problems being deployed due to server intelligence. And Scott raised the point about the uh, the concept of Greece was introduced to prevent future intelligence. Um, Gr Scott, you, you said you said Greece is fascinating. I've ne I've never heard of this. Um, I think it was John Travolta when I think of Greece. Um, can you maybe Nick just give us a quick run through what what Greece is and why why you know why why it's a good thing? Sure. So um, some of the problems that protocols have being deployed in the wild happen from uh, implementers assuming that it will always look a certain way. So if you, uh, if you want to have a protocol that can eventually be upgraded in the future, uh, you need to have pieces of it that are version fields or that are, um, say, cipher types or, or, or various different things where you don't actually know what's going to be in there in the future, but you want to make sure that um, in the future, when a new protocol comes comes out or a new addition comes out, that it works with existing uh, implementations. So the idea of Greece is to uh, make up future versions of uh, the protocol and put and and put that inside of what you're sending. So uh, it, it's really the idea of being uh, liberal in what you send. So uh, if you're talking about um, different negotiation parts in TLS. There's which types of ciphers and which version and which types of uh, elliptic curves, say, that you support. Um, uh, the idea of Greece is to add in random-looking future ones. And uh, if the server uh, breaks because of that, then uh, the people developing the server will be more likely to, um, to fix it ahead of time because uh, real browsers in the world will, will, won't work with it. So the idea of Greece is to try to make something um, to, to take these joints and, and really oil them up with, um, with, by putting in a lots of random future things so that when you actually do need to introduce something actually new that both sides negotiate, that uh, all the protocols around, all the implementations are, are tolerant of that. Greece is the joint, effectively. That yeah, makes a lot of sense to me now. Um, Scott, that, that's something you said in particular that you found Greece to be re a really interesting part. I mean, wh what is it that, about that? Is it because it, it makes things work? Is that what, what gets your interest? No, I mean, it's just more, it shows it shows how, how much the ecosystem and our understanding of the problems is maturing. You know, the, the standards body is starting to recognize things that we've fallen down on in the past and making sure that they're not going to happen again in the future. And I think that will only increase our rate of progress as we go forwards. And then for my security background, this is kind of like fuzzing at scale. So I'm really, um, you know, I'm really happy to see these kinds of, of methodologies being deployed outside of, of the traditional scenarios where you would expect to see them. Great. Okay. I'm just going to throw one more question. I'll, 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 Maybe I'll put this over to um, to Vlad and Nick first. Um, just know that I think it was in I think it was in Nick's side of the presentation. There, um, you mentioned that about TLS 1.3 removes support for several weak ciphers. Um, one, one of them was the insecure downgrade Poodle. Now I, I just had a quick ref refresh myself of Poodle when you mentioned that. Um, it, uh, this was this came out October the 14th, 2014. Um, I'm just reading the Google blog here. Um, uh, security Google blog, obviously. Um, the details of SSL version three of vulnerability. Um, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, Brad, we'll throw this to you first, uh, rather than Nate. But um, in terms of that, you know, that was a year when we had Heartbleed, we had Shellshock, and then we had this one. 
Um, do you think it was taken seriously? Because I, I, I can remember, you know, obviously Heartbleed was huge. Uh, there was a couple more that followed it, and then, you know, Bash Bug or Shell Shock, whichever one you call it, came along. And then this one came along. Do you think people were really taking this seriously because there were so many coming one after another? Well, you can tell by the chart on the next page. Yeah, uh, Josh, did you want to take this? I, I was just going to comment first that. Um, yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to comment that that, that the um, the chart I showed in terms of servers supporting SSL v3, uh, the next year there was still 30% that implemented it. So um, you can take what you will from that. Jo uh, go for it, Josh. Well, that's a lot. But yeah, I think uh, people took it seriously because we did see an acceleration in TLS adoption uh, following those attacks. Uh, especially because uh, many browsers started uh, warning people about using the ciphers. So many websites didn't have much choice when they started upgrading to TLS 1.2. And not as much as we wanted to, but I think it did uh, sing through to at least some websites, some people. Yeah. Well, I mean, just something that. that that struck me upon me uh, upon seeing the presentation there. I just thought, well, I wonder if I refresh myself of that. And I just wondered if all these, you know, these, these bugs all came one after another. If it was taken seriously, but it was, like I say, quite significantly different. But uh, just just my my comment really on that. But, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up the uh, the last vote, which is currently. Here. I'm going to give that a few more seconds. Uh, I'm just going to look at the second poll vote uh, we ran. Was um, why do you think that TLS 1.2 needed to be updated? Um, 45% said IoT, 25% said cloud and server deployments, 19% uh, other, but you chose not to let us know why, 9% uh, are more open internet. Um, Nick, let me, let's just get the last thought on that one then. So 45% said IoT, 25% cloud and server deployments. So add them together, 70% for cloud and, and IoT. Uh, was why, was, would you agree with that? Was that the reason or was it just because of those those, those Things we've just been talking about, you know, the the, the in the production tier, that's 1.3 in production and the rollout and the problems. Is that, uh, you know, those options? Uh, I think there's there's a lot of reasons to upgrade, um, as, as we sort of laid out um, in the IoT case. This this performance aspect of having one fewer round trip is a big one, um, and cloud and and server deployments as well. Uh, latency is very important. So one of the bigger drivers, this is this is the first time in the history of SSL TLS that uh, uh, you can actually connect without having to do two round trips on the server. So um, that's that's really motivated a lot of people across a lot of different industries to um, to be excited about TLS 1.3. Awesome, fantastic. And the last question, I'm going to stop the voting right there. Um, and I'm just going to, Josh, I'm just going to get your thoughts on this as we finish up. Uh, the last question we ran was, we're seeing greater adoption of SSL. Will this make the internet more trusted? 54% said yes. 24% uh, depends on the website. 12% depends on the, the website certificate authority. 9% uh, no. Um, so I guess that probably is quite good things for, for Let's Encrypt. Obviously, you're a certificate authority, you're 12%, but 54% think that SSLs, I know there's been this stuff about Google um, flagging those who don't have um, HTTPS um, or SSL certificates. So yeah, generally people are seeing this as, as, a, as a good thing. You, you see that as, as a positive thing, I guess, as well. Yeah, I didn't entirely hear the question. Oh, right. The uh, question was, yeah, we're seeing greater adoption of SSL. Will this make the internet more trusted? 54% said yes. Yeah, I think so. I think it's good. It's all good news. When people, everything's safer, everything's much more trusted. So, all right, fantastic. Well, with that, we are going to wrap things up here. So, um, thanks to everybody uh, for, for joining us today, for listening in. I really uh, appreciate the audience. And obviously, if you're listening on demand, then uh, thanks very much for your time. Obviously, huge thanks today to our sponsor, Cloudflare, and our four speakers, Nick, Vlad, Scott, and Josh uh, for giving up their time to speak with us today. We really appreciate all of you. Um, for our next webinar, we're actually going to be back next Thursday. That is where we're going to be looking at um, the concept of it. Uh, why did your business can't ignore the need for a password manager any longer. That will be uh, me next uh, 
next twenty uh, second of March, next Thursday, uh, three p.m. GMT. That's eleven a.m. Eastern because of the uh, the time difference. So just be conscious of the four hour difference. Um, and also next week, don't forget Tuesday, Wednesday, it's the Info Security Magazine virtual conference. We'll be covering all sorts of stuff from uh, GDPR to social media attacks to uh, scalability to convergence to incident response. Across two days, there's lots of information on the website, which is www.infosecurity-magazine.com. On there, you'll find a link to also where all of our old webinars are, so you'll find some stuff on there if you're interested in this kind of slightly more the technical side, some stuff on DevOps, on application security as well, so hopefully something that's going to fit for everybody. Um, there will be a recording of this uh, webinar available very soon, so you can listen all over again. And um, also, just before you go, please do rate the webinar, let us know what you thought of today, and uh, Hopefully give us some nice feedback and let us know what you thought. And with that, we're going to leave you. But big, big thanks once again to all our speakers and our sponsor and to all of you for listening. And we'll see you next time.